All right. All Thank right. you. Welcome, welcome, everyone. We're so excited to have you here with us. You may know that this webinar is part of Love Resists, a joint campaign of the UUA and the UUSC. Love Resists is our Unitarian Universalist response to this political moment, this political moment. Our piece of a movement much, much, much larger than ourselves, and one that is firmly and clearly guided by the leadership of those who are most at stake. We are working to build a community of moral courage, to be ready to respond to that call of this moment in which increasing inequity, racism, and xenophobia threaten the very well-being of many. We, are, we have the audacity to work to end criminalization and to expand sanctuary. What does this mean? to end criminalization and to expand sanctuary. We're gonna be hearing from four frontline organizers who will each share what this means to each of them. Before we hear from them, I wanna offer a few centering words and um, these are words by the Reverend Richard Gilbert. We meet on holy ground, brought into being as life encounters life, as personal histories merge into the communal story, as we take on the pain and the pride of our companions, as separate selves becoming community. How desperate is our need for one another, our silent beckoning, to our neighbors, our invitations to share life and death together, our welcome into the lives of those we meet and their welcome into our own. May our souls capture this treasured time. May our spirits celebrate our meeting in this time, in this space with each and every one of you for we truly meet on holy ground. And just to say, I am so glad that each of you is here. The subject is big, it's critical. I think of criminalization as an absolute dismissal and negation of the first principle of Unitarian Universalism, that inherent worth and dignity of every every person. Criminalization strips people of their humanity, defines them as unworthy, unworthy of safety, unworthy of sympathy, unworthy of being able to live free. I'll close with a rhetorical question. What is a punishment-driven model of law enforcement getting us? And where on earth is it taking us? Blessings be. Thank you. I'm so glad you're here. Um, so uh, Denise and I are both members of the Love Resist organizing team. We also have two other members of the organizing team uh, doing some background roles for us here. Thank you to mm -hmm. Reverend Paul Langston Daly, who is, is uh, managing our tech and recording for today. And uh, I'm going to move the camera over to the lovely Susan Leslie, who is um, managing the chat box responses and who will be um, selecting our questions for the Q&A. Um, all right, um, and uh, just to note, it appears that it is not recording. Um, it says recording right there. Okay, it appears that it is recording. And so we're good to go, woo. Um, well, I can't tell you how excited I am to be here um, to get a chance to facilitate this conversation with inspiring leaders and thinkers shaping our movement today. 
Um, thank you all for joining us. Uh, each of them will be presenting briefly, followed by some roundtable discussion, and there'll be an opportunity to ask questions, um, which we'll be taking in the chat box. At the end of the webinar, we'll provide some resources you can use to bring this conversation back to your congregation or community and uh, learn how to get more involved. Um, and so, um, Paul, if you could just pull up the slide that, that, that uh, lists who our speakers are today. Um, so we're going to get started with a five minute presentation from each of them, uh, addressing the question, how are you seeing your communities impacted by criminalization today? In what ways are these issues similar and in what ways are they different than before the 2016 elections? And how are you organizing to resist and protect each other? Um, first, we'll be hearing from Jacinto Gonzalez, um, who is the field organizer for Mi Gente, a political movement for Latinx activists that is also explicitly pro-Black, pro-woman, pro pro-queer, and pro-poor, knowing that their community is all of this and more. Um, previously, with the Congress of Day Laborers, Jacinta organized workers to build power across race and industry in post-Katrina New Orleans. Um, thank you so much for being here with us today, Jacinta. Thank you so much, Hannah, for, for the introduction and for the opportunity to present. It's, it's really exciting to see so many people um, coming on for this conversation and, and to have a, an appetite for a framework that includes more people, right? And that isn't actually dividing people into silos, but bringing people together. Um, so as you said, I, I work as a field director for Mi Gente um, and have been supporting mem our membership um, across the country in some of the resistance against some of the attacks against immigrant communities. And so I'm going to talk a little bit right now, just like what is the panorama of what are immigrants facing in terms of the deportation and criminalization machinery, but also what's been the framework that we've found useful in fighting back and resisting and organizing um, given these challenges. So, you know, it, it's, it's for, for many, many years, the anti-deportation movement has been organizing not only to stop deportations, but also to stop the, the police state that is really criminalizing and marginalizing communities. Um, all of the factors that currently um, are targeting people always existed under the Obama administration. It's no um, coincidence that Obama was known as the deporter in chief. And so it's important to kind of have a historical memory that really understands that a lot of the infrastructure that was created to incarcerate and deport was built, you know, for many, many years, but definitely under the eight, the last eight years. Um, where we reached uh, over a million deportations. Um, at the same time, though, it's also under, important to understand the differences. And everything has been turbocharged, and the attacks are um, even more intense at this moment. Um, many immigrants who are facing deportation under the Obama administration, we had the organizing tactic of being able to fight for what was later called prosecutorial discretion. And basically it just meant that there was a way to be able to fight back people's deportations based on their contributions to their communities, their family ties, you know, their work history. Um, but what has been very, very clear under the current administration, um, during the, uh, under a white supremacist uh, administration that is pushing this agenda, is that now everyone is a target. So what we really start to see is that the narrative of we only deport criminals now starts to apply to everyone. And so it's not about differentiating whether someone is or isn't a criminal, it's everyone is under this category. So anyone, because they don't have immigration status, can be targeted for deportation, and they're, being, they're doing so in many, many ways. Um, the first to understand is that the primary way that people are still detained and deported is through our local criminal justice system. So people are being picked up by local police, people are being taken to local jails and, local, and, and state prisons, and that is the number one way for people to get deported. So what we've seen is that all of the fighting that happened previously to stop the Secure Communities Program has been reversed, and now we have even more detainers. So detainers are these pieces of paper that exist within jails that allow for people to be transferred to immigration custody, really solidifying the, the, the relationships between police and ICE. And we've seen a 70% increase in those detainers. 
So you can imagine if you're a small town police department that is basically just racially profiling people in the street and taking them to jail, you are guaranteed that that person is going to be deported because there's more detainers that are, are, are being placed on people. But not only that, ICE is also having more activity in the street. So what we've seen is that there's been over a 40% increase in ICE arrests in communities. And so that means that every day ICE is raiding neighborhoods where they go to people's homes, where they go to grocery stores, where they go to different locations and are picking people up um, to, to deport them. Overall in the country, it's been a 43% increase, but there's particular field offices, for example, the New Orleans field office or the Southern field office um, that you know, cover states like Tennessee and Arkansas, Mississippi and Louisiana. And they've seen a 272% increase in, in ICE rates. Um, so you really start to see that it's a climate of fear and criminalization. And all of the immigrants who previously were able to fight back their deportation and have been going to ICE check-ins or have been going to courts are now being told that they have to deliver their plane tickets. So many of you have probably been called by your local community organization to come to the ICE offices to an ICE check-in or to an ICE court. Um, because what we're seeing is that people who previously for many years had just been showing up to routine um, conversations with ICE agents are now being told they have to immediately leave the country. Um, so these are all kind of the things that are happening within ICE that is really pushing people um, to, to deport and is making sure that there's more people that are being detained. Um, what has been very, very clear, one of the biggest um, issues that the uh, Trump administration is facing is that its appetite for deportation is bigger than its uh, machinery. And so there's still some due process protections that are protecting immigrants, which means that the number one thing that's happening is detention beds are filling up. Um, and so for that reason, uh, Congress has decided to give um, ICE even more money to detain even more people, raising the number of detention beds to 50,000 across the country. So we're starting to see this, this infrastructure start to, to balloon more and more. Um, and given all of these threats, what we've been seeing across the country is um, that um, truly what we're seeing is that there's a need to be able to create better policies that are going to protect communities. Many people decided to, in this moment, advocate for sanctuary policies, either at their city council level um, or in their congregations to try to protect people. But very quickly, we realized that the framework of just sanctuary was just trying to give kind of protections to a select few and didn't understand all of the ways that people were being criminalized and targeted. So in a country where one in three people are going to be arrested before they're 23, it was insufficient to simply say that we have to separate police from ICE. And we actually had to start to talk about policing. And we understood that in that conversation around policing, we also started to include other communities and have really like sincere conversations about what does um, over-policing and racialized policing mean in the United States right now. And from there, we launched a, a framework that we called the Expand, Defend, and Resist um, framework. So for us, it's really about expanding the definition of sanctuary it's about defending our loved ones and defending our wins, but also resisting um, the Trump administration's agenda. And so for us, that means that we not only are advocating for policies that go against ICE, but we have to start to advocate for policies that reduce um, incarceration and policing, that decriminalize certain offenses, um, that eliminate the use of gang databases and other thing, like databases that are collecting information and data on our communities, that we have to support um, programs that create employment for um, trans and LGBTQ communities, and that we have to fund organizing as well as legal services. And so these are some of the policies that we've been putting out of being able to say, actually, there's not one policy that's going to save us, and, we, and there's not going to be just one four wall thing that's going to be able to protect communities, but we really have to create a movement that understands how everyone is being targeted and how we have to fight back and organize. So I'm sure I'll, we'll have a little bit more time during the questions to explain a little bit more of, of the specific policies or the, the specific resistant moments. But again, for us, it's just about creating a platform where people of different communities can come together to fight back. Awesome, thank you so much, Jacinta. Um, next, we're gonna be hearing from uh, Fatima Ahmed. 
Uh, Fatima is a former biomedical engineer turned community organizer working against systemic racism and Islamophobia. Before moving to Boston to become the Muslim Justice League's deputy director, Fatima worked with organizations across North Carolina to connect Muslim, Black, and Latinx communities around criminalization and surveillance. So um, just as a reminder, the question is about how you're seeing criminal seeing your communities uh, impacted by criminalization today, um, and how are you organizing to resist and protect each other in these times? Hi, thank you for having me. I'm so excited to talk about this um, and to learn from everyone here today. So I wanna talk, um, in terms of criminalization of Muslims, I wanna talk about really a lesser known program called Countering Violent Extremism, which on the surface, sounds like something that everybody wants to do, right? Um, it's very well named um, to hide what is actually a soft surveillance program of Muslims, and in particular of Muslim youth. Um, and as was mentioned with deportations, this program also um, actually started by the Obama administration um, and really, um, you know, laid out this framework and it's actually model, modeled after a program in the UK, which is about five to 10 years ahead of us. So we can easily look to what's happening in the UK, um, understand like where this program is, is headed. This program essentially, you know, recruits community leaders. So teachers, mental health providers, um, leaders within the Muslim community, so imams, mosques, um, Muslim-led organizations, and other Muslim leaders to identify youth that they think are susceptible to quote-unquote radicalization or quote-unquote violent extremism. This ends up basically securitizing relationships with the Muslim community. So the funding for these programs are coming from the Department of Homeland Security and the Department of Justice. They're not coming from, you know, other departments. They're coming from departments that are focused on security and are focused on law enforcement. It ends up further stigmatizing the Muslim community by, again, tying us to this narrative that you know, Muslims are somehow on a conveyor belt to violent extremism. And unless somebody identifies um, that and pulls them off, that they will, you know, not, um, that they will somehow end up, you know, doing some heinous act of violence. One thing to understand is that this program even under the Obama administration, has always disproportionately focused on Muslims and people of color. Um, under the Obama administration, they included you know, a few token other groups that maybe said that they were focusing on white supremacy or other types of violence, but it has always completely focused on the Muslim community. And even in its language, when you talk about violent extremism or radicalization, clearly the way that the media and the government consistently uses those terms, it's always about Muslims. So that's one, that's one reason that it's really racist and Islamophobic, but that's not necessarily why it's dangerous. So why it's dangerous is it's actually using um, unfounded science, junk science, to say that we can predict who's going to come in after violence, which is not true. We don't know how to predict that. If we did, um, you know, we might have an easier time fighting what seems like you know, very regular um, acts of awful um, violence in this country, but we really don't know how to do that. So because this is using this junk science, it really allows them to use very racist um, characterizations of Muslims to identify who they think is becoming radicalized. So one way that they do this is through um, signs of religiosity. So, you know, they might look at a young person and say, oh wow, this Muslim kid started growing a beard, we should worry about him. Or this young Muslim girl started wearing 
the hijab and they might start to worry about her. Um, they also look at signs that you're unhappy with the government, which of course, if these things were applied across the country, everyone would be on this list, but they're not. So they look at, you know, if you have, if you perceive, um, injustice, if you protest, um, foreign policy in particular. So they, they add in things like foreign policy in particular to, again, to like focus this on, on Muslims um, and youth of color in general. So I think afterwards you'll get the, the list of, you know, various um, characteristics that they, that they look at and it's really just completely outrageous. Um, and I think the other thing to know that is different between, you know, after the 2016 election versus before the 2016 election is, you know, after Trump's election, there are a lot of people who are starting to think about Islamophobia and starting to understand that it's, it's more than just um, interpersonal acts um, or interpersonal violence, but that there is, you know, structural Islamophobia and that that's very much tied to racism. Um, but in doing so, a lot of people tend to just oppose whatever Trump is doing without thinking about what was laid behind Trump. So what was done by the Obama administration, what has been done for years now that has built up this framework of Islamophobia. So there are a lot of people who saw that Trump dropped a grant to a program that focuses on white supremacy that's under this countering violent extremism program and people said that's terrible you know they should still include this group rather than just focus on muslims but that's not what we want we don't want equal opportunity surveillance having you know one group that focuses on white supremacy to cover for a program <laughs> that in itself is structurally racist and islamophobic um, is really not helpful. Um, so one thing is, you know, we want to make sure that people are actually hearing out <laughs> Muslims and people who are impacted by these programs, um, you know, before speaking out, you know, for it. Um, the other thing that we're, we're doing really to, to resist this is we're connecting Muslim communities across um, different cities. We're connecting with Muslims in the UK because we realize that this program is popping up everywhere. Um, so we're trying to do a lot of um, work across, you know, the very diverse Muslim community to resist this program. Thank you. Thank you so much, Fatima. Um, so now we are going to be moving to hear from, sorry, let me see who is next, um, from Ruth Irakula. Um, Ruth is the executive uh, co-director of the Center for Ethical Living and uh, Social Justice Renewal um, in New Orleans and also a coordinating committee member with the um, Dignity in Schools campaign. As a community activist, uh, Ruth works with parents uh, addressing problems with school discipline, um, advocating for their children. Um, thank you, Ruth, for joining us. Yeah, thank you. Can you hear me all right? Yes. Great, great. Um, I apologize for the use of the phone, um, but having problem with the audio. Um, and so um, in terms of um, looking at mass incarceration, um, I live in New Orleans, um, been here 20 years, um, and uh, doing anti-racist work for about 16 of those years. And so, um, as probably most everybody knows who has joined in, um, knows that we highly incarcerate um, a lot of people. Um, what we have seen in terms of the education system in New Orleans, and also across the country, has been that there's been a rise in terms of youth of color who are, who are directly impacted um, through, the, through, the, through the education system to the criminal justice system, meaning that you know, we're seeing a, a rise in children who their first contact with the criminal justice system is through schools. 
Um, and this is directly linked to the privatization of schools, um, the charter so-called reform movement, um, which has spiked a rise in the amount of children of color who end up in prison ultimately. Um, with the rise of Trump, um, I think that, so, so I think that, that several of the speakers, well, all of the speakers have said this already, uh, is that, you know, we saw a lot of um, kind of the, um, the kind of draconian measures um, that were applied to the education system um, with the Obama movement, with the Obama administration. Um, and so um, there's been a real fight over the past um, maybe 10 years um, to ensure that you know our children are not get, getting pushed out over um, minor things um, such as um, um, you know not having the right you know socks on or not having the right shoes on. There are actual stories of children um, who have ended up in the criminal justice system because they did not have the right uniform on, or um, what's called willful disobedience, where you know being a child. Um, means sometimes, you know, you might roll your eye at a teacher, um, and that means that, you know, you end up getting suspended and ultimately expelled. Um, and we know that, you know, being put out of school um, increases your risk of ending up in the criminal justice system. And so we've seen a, seen a spike of this over the past 10 years. Um, and so kind of our message out there has been that, you know, um, when this started to happen right after the federal flood, um, right after Hurricane Katrina, um, and um, the government um, put together measures to make sure that they could come over and take over our schools, um, which right now are almost 100% privatized. Um, and I, I, I want to, to reiterate that, is that almost 100% um, of our schools are no longer public schools. They are private schools that are run by CEOs who are not from here, who have come from across the country to come and capitalize public schools in New Orleans, right? And that has impacted specifically black and brown communities in the city. Um, and when you look at that in terms of the rise of gentrification and kind of the disaster capitalism that has happened um, in New Orleans, um, and you put all of those things together, um, it's can, you know, it's very clear, it's kind of like the impact that it is. Um, and one of the things that I want people to understand is that, you know, that all of these systems work together, right? And so education, transportation, capitalism, immigration, um, all the things that the fellow speakers have talked about, they work hand in hand. Um, immigrants, you know, who are in public schools, who now, police can go into schools now and target um, <laughs> you know, children, you know, who, who are immigrants, you know, and take their, take their, you know, I mean, you might be a, a parent coming to pick up your child in school, the police will build, will be there to pick you up and possibly your child. Um, and so as we talk about this um, further uh, during the next 30 minutes, I just really want us to really focus on, you know, how these systems work together um, and, and how we as, as activists, and also Unitarian Universalists, um, how we think about strategies and how we think about social change and how that happens. Because um, what I can say is that under the Trump administration, in a way that um, I think that, you know, if you talk to a lot of black communities, um, they will say, well, we've been catching hell anyway, right? Um, but in a way that, you know, that, that there is more of a, of, of a uh, social awareness of all of the targets, you know, how do we talk about, you know, coming together to build strategies so that we are all protected, right? Um, and that's kind of what I want to see and what I'm interested in, in us discussing further. Thank you so much, Ruth. Um, we have one last speaker before we go into the roundtable discussion, and that is Jamila Hamami, who is the founder and executive director of the Queer Detainee Empowerment Project in New York City. Uh, they are an organizer and social worker, and through QDEP, they support LGBTQ and HIV positive immigrants in detention and asylum seekers being released from detention. Um, they also organize campaigns to build safer communities for people at the intersections of uh, undocumented and queer identities. Uh, thank you so much for being with us, Jamila. Yeah, thank you all so much. And I just appreciate you all making this space. 
Um, Jacinta from Mi Gente really spoke a lot to the things that I have to say. And so I'm happy to be able to build off of that. So I don't have to go through all of it. Um, just to kind of backtrack a little bit, as we spoke about um, Obama being the deporter in, in chief, um, I think that it's incredibly important that we recognize that and we hold that and we understand that things have definitely gotten to a point where they're worse. Um, I definitely want to, unfortunately, honor the reality that that Obama isn't everything that we uh, had hoped he would be, right? As uh, me as a person mm -hmm. of color from an immigrant family, for example. Mm -hmm. um, the presidential executive orders of January and February 2017 promised that there would be further discretionary powers to ICE, and there was more funding, as Jacinta said. And I think that it's really important that we realize what that actually means. And, and I think that she really touched on that brilliantly. So I'm not gonna go too much into that, except for some of the things that went through the legislation in the South was um, allowing police to act as immigration officers, right? So that's something that's a little bit different from before. Um, I think that that level of harassment is dis disproportionately affecting communities of color, obviously, but also LGBTQI and HIV positive folks. Um, I think that the understanding the reality of the extensive immigration detention and deportation systems that exist within the prison industrial complex are also super important pieces for us to kind of build on beyond um, where we're currently kind of standing out on the platform of understanding where we're, where we're at. Um, at this moment, only 14% of individuals in immigration detention have legal representation. And I think that as long as that is the case, we're going to have a mass number of individuals that are, are getting deported, right? Um, I think that when we talk about criminalization, it can look like a lot of different things. So we're based here in New York City. And one of the biggest reasons why we have people that get locked up are for jumping turnstiles. Something that's a $60 ticket for jumping the subway turnstile for a citizen um, could result in someone being put in immigration detention here. Um, often a lot of the folks that we work with, there's a lot of criminalization and assumption that transgender women are actually sex workers. And so from there, they're being locked up in first Rikers Island, and then from there with ICE detainers, they're being put in immigration detention. And so immigration detention is such an expansive system. And we just had, um, I think Ruth, uh, I hope I'm, I'm remembering correctly, uh, previously speak to um, just the privatization of, of education. This also built in the privatization of the prison industrial complex and the, det and the detention system. Specifically, um, at this moment, over there's over 200 immigration detention facilities in this country, including beds that have been purchased in jails and prisons. And out of those, many of them are actually run by private facility or private companies. Um, one of them being CCA, which recently changed their name to Civic. I can't remember. I think it's. I can't remember what it is. It's Civic something. And I, I specifically recall this because there's a large organization that we're a part of um, that's named Civic. Thank you, Core Civic. I appreciate it, Angela and Anna and Asita. <laughs> um, that uh, Core Civic, that that is one of the larger um, companies that has um, multiple multiple um, facilities throughout the country, and then also Geo. And they aren't just invested in the privatization of detention facilities, they're also now investing in things called alternative to detention programs, which QDEP used to be considered an alternative to detention program. Um, but at this point, we have to really shift gears and call ourselves a post-release program. So anyway, moving forward, um, people can get arrested for misdemeanors. Um, like I had said before, and then put in immigration detention facilities. And I think that it can be really, really concerning for us. Um, I think that one of the other things we have to think about are the actual bond system and what the bond system looks like in this current situation. Um, for the longest time, there was a back and forth between ICE and judges, whether or not 
who was able to make the decision of what the bond was. So the bond floor in the United States is $1,500. The immigration judge often sets the bonds even higher, which are unattainable for even working class people, let alone those who lack immigration status and employment authorization documents. So those numbers are climbing to 10,000. Recently, I heard a $70,000 as well. And I think that it's really important that we think about that. Um, I think that the other things that are imperative for us for a community to be thinking about is how can we support immigrant communities, those that have been detained specifically by raising bonds, by providing post-release support to folks that are currently in immigration, immigration detention. Mm -hmm. And then from there, I'm going to open it up to questions with the larger group, and I'm happy to answer more. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, everybody. Um, I'm going to start with a few roundtable questions that we've prepared. And in the meantime, people can be um, putting their own questions into the chat box, and we will include them uh, in the Q&A. Uh, so just to start with, uh, I wanted to ask, why is it important that we build an intersectional movement to resist criminalization and expand sanctuary to create communities that are safe for all? What do we gain by working together and by drawing the connections between the attacks targeting different groups? Because I think about it, I don't think it's just because it's the right thing to do and it's ethical. It's like, this is how we win, but why is this how we win? <laughs> um, so I feel like one of the largest things that we can really focus on as a broader movement is that a united from I think that uh, within queued up alone it's not just immigrant communities LGBTQI communities Muslim communities that all come together um, I, I find that in New York City when we're collaborating together and we're pushing for power it's been much more effective whenever it's been collective resistance so with all the individuals through <laughs> the different communities, the different organizations through community organizing and more broadly around criminalization. We've had so much more power and been able to make so much more change. So for example, the Close Rikers campaign, Close Rikers wouldn't be what it is if it didn't have all of the organizations that are a part of, which is almost, almost I think 180 organizations that we're a part of at this point that are a part of this campaign. So I think collective power, really really bridges and pushes forward in a moment of resistance that we need so dearly um as somebody who um works with um unitarian universalists um and somebody who has kind of been brought into that phase um not um kind of third, serendipitously. Um, I really would like for us to think about what it means to have collective liberation um, and what that means as spiritual practice, right? Um, and so if we are understanding that the seven principles include that, you know, everybody is, is, has inherent worth and dignity, then of course we need to fight for each other, right? Um, if we understand that there's an interconnectedness um, among human beings across the planet, then how dare we not, um, you know, fight for liberation for everybody, right? And so I think that this comes at a very critical time. And, and for myself as somebody who um, also is a spiritual leader, you know, that if we are going to say, I'll say this for myself personally, that for myself, the work that I do is spiritual practice for myself personally. Um, and so if we believe in justice really and truly, then how can we stand on the sidelines and not get in the fight together? Um, because we are all aware, all of us who are on this forum, that there is something that is out there that is attacking all of it that means that, you know, each human being is worthy of life and all of that, all that it comes with, the quality, the love, the freedom. Um, and so, you know, I would say that, you know, that that, that is why it is important. And also, I mean, we understand historically that, you know, if they're coming for one group, they're coming for everybody, right? Like, we know this. And so if we understand that historically, and, and, and this is one of the things that I talk about in terms of, you know, when we talk about racism, um, one of the things that white people tend to have is a historical kind of and not understanding, you know, how things happen. 
periodically because they happen all over and over. It's cyclical. It's, it's, it's perpetuated. And so if we do not get in the fight together, then, you know, then, you know, we're all going to be harmed. Um, and so, you know, I would offer that as, as, you know, that's something that is important for us to think about in terms of, you know, how we think about intersectionality um, and all of the other things, right? Yeah, and, and just to add a little bit to that, um, I just wanted to say, you know, like, I, I think that, that folks have, have um, really beautifully and, and um, powerfully talked about, like, the political reasons and the spiritual reasons why we must um, fight together. But also just on a basic level, like practically, when we don't, we come up with solutions that don't work, right? So like traditionally people conceptualize like sanctuary city policies is simply like just have local police not work with immigration and then you're good, right? Then no one's going to get deported. But what we see in practice is that it's actually very different. And so, for example, I want to share the story of Eric, who's a young person, a young immigrant um, Latino um, in D.C., D.C., police is not supposed to work with immigration agents. They're supposed to have a sanctuary city policy. But he goes to a school where, of course, he was criminalized. He was um, accused of being part of a gang. He was arrested and given, on his first arrest, eight charges, including kidnapping, based on you know, made up stuff by the cops. Um, and even though he's fighting the charges, even though he's never been convicted, even though he's fighting against the policies of his school, ICE independently went to his house because of that arrest. And so that's why for us, it's not only about fighting his deportation, it's actually fighting why are the cops in his school to begin with? And why is he giving these charges? And why is the DA prosecuting him? So if we just go at it from an immigration angle, angle we're going to come up short because we're ignoring the policies around his school, the policies around the police in general, why the DAs are prosecuting people. And so we have to really have a comprehensive view to be able to get at even being able to protect Eric from deportation. Um, so we really, it's, it's, it's on all levels, we really need to be able to work together and build a collective movement that lets us tear down these, this infrastructure as opposed to just making it into silos. Yeah, I feel like all of you guys explain it so well. Um, one of the things that keeps coming up for me in this moment is that there's got to be some way that it can be a point of transformation, right? Like we don't actually just want the country we would have had if Hillary Clinton won. Um, many of you have spoken about how many of these policies started under Obama and the infrastructure was created for Trump to put them on steroids and make them even more damaging. But we're not looking to go back to what we had that wasn't good enough. So how can this moment be one of transformation? How can we continue to think in visionary and inspiring terms when we feel like there's so much we have to resist and fight back on so that we actually use this moment when so many people are waking up, when there's so much movement um, to build what we really want. Um, uh, Jamila, did you, oh, uh, Fatima. <laughs> Okay, I'll go first. Um, so for me, I think this is really the moment to help people understand all of these roots that are really tangled together, racism, capitalism, Islamophobia, um, and that all of, the, all of the different forms of prisons that exist, right? Um, I think that this is really a good time because people are reaching out and people want to connect and people want to, to actually do something about this, um, which can be, you know, easily misguided, like we talked about the, the sanctuary city policies that happened in Boston as well. Um, but for me, you know, this is an effective time to help people understand, like, Islamophobia is not a new thing. It doesn't just apply to Arabs and South Asians either. There are Black Muslims. There have been Black Muslims here since Black people were brought <laughs> to this country through slavery. Um, and Islamophobia has always been tied to anti-Black racism. Um, and, and, you know, on, on the other end as well, to help people understand um, how these systems really work together, like how 
you know, the Department of Homeland Security was created and built on Islamophobia. And that took ICE, you know, under the Department of Homeland Security and FEMA as well, which is you know, something that, that is often surprising um, to people that FEMA is actually under the Department of Homeland Security. But it is essential that we use this time uh, to really engage in that, to really teach people um, how these structures have existed, how they exist today, um, so that we can think about what we should build, um, you know, in, in their stead, um, rather than just looking at taking a step back from Trump back to, like, Obama-era policies. Ruth? Um, I apologize, Ruth. It sounds like we are not hearing you. Um, maybe your phone is muted and you can unmute it and give that a try. Use star six. Can you hear me now? Yes, thank you. Okay, great. Um, one of the things that um, I think that is a valuable practice for us to do this work um, that can be so agonizing and exhausting um, and very painful. Um, I was talking to a group of students yesterday um, who were talking about a lot of the same things that we are tonight. Um, and one of the things that I asked for them to do, and, 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 and a tool that somebody had, had given me, um, and I wish that I could link it to the actual person who did it, but I, at some point I will remember. Um, but, but in terms of us fighting against something, then how about we think about and imagine the things that we actually want to build? Like, what would the world look like in a way that, you know, we know that oppression does not exist? Like, what does the United States look like if, you know, children weren't being tossed out of school for nothing and put in jail? What would it mean to lessen the mass incarceration system? What would it mean for LGBTQ folks to not be targeted? What does it mean for, you know, the immigrant community? Like, what does that mean for us to work together and actually have collective liberation? Um, and I'm thinking about, you know, like actual physical manifestations of what it looks like. Um, and so I would like for us to think about more of those things. Um, the fight is well and good and very much needed, but I think that we also need something that also brings us joy, that brings us um, something to kind of not maybe look forward to, maybe it's the wrong, wrong way to put it. But if we can imagine, you know, what it is that we're fighting for and what that actually looks like. Um, then maybe we can start doing some building um, as opposed to just tearing down. I think that both things need to happen at the same time. Um, so I would just like to offer that up. Thank you. Jacinta, did you want to add anything before we move to audience questions? Well, the, the one thing I would just like to say is I, I think the, the this moment we're actually seeing like people, the, the administration is doubling down on criminalization in a way that makes their intentions very obvious. So even when we look at, for example, the federal level, look at the Department of Justice and Jeff Sessions and how he's really pushing forward an agenda of criminalization, criminalizing communities around issues of, around drugs, around immigration, and really trying to push federal um, prosecutions as much as he can. This again has been happening under the Obama administration, but it was very hard to attack um, Obama's ad uh, administration for racially profiling people and, and incarcerating people. Everyone in this moment can agree that Jeff Sessions is a racist and Trump is a racist. And so there's a way in which we can galvanize that energy to really dig deeper about how these systems are manifesting those principles. So why the, the incarceration state in the US is based on um, racist practices and racist laws. You know, we, we have this opportunity to create this narrative and this drumbeat. So for us, it's important to be able to, to dig deep and, and have the analysis building conversation and build the practice of fighting together and resisting in day-to-day in -day life. Um, great, and we have um, just uh, some final thoughts from Jamila before we head into audience questions. Hi, so I actually just want to take a quick moment to kind of pivot and 
And I recognize that a lot of people are Clinton supporters, but uh, last year during the National Immigration Coalition, like our National Immigration Conference, I actually was there and I ended up kind of heckling her because she went about talking about how they were going to close down all the private facilities leave the public detention facilities open so i just want to just like flag that that like the clintons are racist too the, the clintons are racist too and i hate to be the bringer of poor awful news because i know that they seem like they were better than than trump but at the same time a lot of what has happened over the last you know 20 years or so around like reform etc for for all the um, different public services it came from them with just destructing them. And I, and I think also when we talk about how we're going to build on this transforma transformative moment, because I think that just very quickly, a story about some folks that QDEP works with is that like we're all directly impacted in some way. And the way that we have found that we've been able to carry this moment forward is that finding people that have actually like directly impacted by this moment in the movement, those that are criminalized queer and trans people that have been locked up, that are immigrants, and then come out and then decide that they want to make a change those are the ones that have been able to carry this movement forward in ways that a lot of other outside people can't and so i think that if you're working within your congregations you should really look upon these individuals especially i mean even in your movement to see where where they see things moving um and that's just very brief and and i'm happy to answer more questions about that uh, thank you all right, thanks so much. Um, Susan, so what do we have in the chat box? What questions have you received? Hey, Dana Buell has asked a great, great question, which is, is the concept of sanctuary something that all of you use? How is it beyond four-wall sanctuary? Is this a definition of sanctuary that's a powerful organizing tool we can use today? So I, I think that sanctuary as um, a construct for faith-based institutions is a really wonderful construct. I think that when we try to push for sanctuary in, in cities, um, it isn't. Uh, I think that that is a very complicated uh, form of sanctuary because it, for example, in New York City, I can speak to where I live at, um, city council has been really pushing and saying, yeah, we're a sanctuary city. This is how we believe. Blah, 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 but then police are still collaborating with immigration and customs enforcement. So that in the end, there really isn't a sanctuary city because they're still engaging with ICE detainers to apprehend people in different ways. For example, the people I was just speaking about that were radicalized after being in detention and became movement leaders, they were picked up out in front of their family shelter, which is the Department of Homeless Services. So I, I really don't think that that way of kind of thinking of sanctuary makes sense. I think that when we talk about congregations and faith-based institutions that are really pushing forward sanctuary, it's imperative. It's imperative to keep communities safe. So I think that if you want to push forward with that, that's something wonderful that you should do and you should reach out to us so we can help you with that. Jacinta? Yeah, so I mean, I think the, the concept of sanctuary, as, as Jamil was saying, I think it, it varies locally um, depending on the context. In some cities, you say sanctuary city policy and it doesn't work. In other places, you use it and you can create momentum. Um, but for us, it really is about let's think about how we're creating sanctuary in all of our organizing. And so that can mean pushing for local and statewide policies to protect our communities. And again, that's where we use the expanded sanctuary definition so that it isn't only limited to policies that talk about ICE, but actually talk about broader criminalization and policing and employment opportunities um, and discrimination. Um, it is sometimes it is about sanctuary and four walls and going into our churches, but sometimes it is also about how do we rally our communities to protect and defend one another. And so that also includes trainings on how to know your rights, how to make sure that we're not allowing police and ICE to violate people's basic rights, right? We don't have to open the doors. We're able to protect and defend each other. We're able to have rapid response networks that are able to come together in moments of crisis so that you're able to have an organized network across different organizations, across different races, across different faiths that are able to both 
push local officials that are able to come in moments of, of need when there are communities that are under attack and facing um, particular violence, um, but are also thinking about more broadly how we're creating a movement that is truly um, protecting everyone and not just thinking about particular communities um, that they quote unquote see as, as more vulnerable. I think particularly as faith communities, it's important. Um, I, I can't remember who of the, the presenters was talking about this so, so, so well, but how we also take leadership um, from those directly affected. People needing sanctuary and needing collective protection um, is not necessarily the same as being paternalistic or protective over quote unquote more vulnerable communities. And so I think when we're able to think about it as something where we're, we're expanding the definition of sanctuary to include us all, we're defending one another through community methods, but also, also through politics and policies, but we're also coming together to build a stronger resistance. And that's why for us, it's, it's the, the expand, defend, and resist um, model that allows us to kind of organize on all of those levels um, in all of the ways that we kind of have to to be able to rise to this moment. I wish we had a lot more time for this conversation, but I am recognizing that we're getting close to eight and I don't want to start losing too many people before we share the re resources that have been created around this that can be used to bring the conversation back to your communities, back to your congregations. Um, and so uh, if you can please uh, pull that up, Paul. Um, First of all, we have a four session study guide. This is for small groups that want to dive more deeply into concept of criminalization and community protection and expanded sanctuary. It's four one hour sessions that involve video, discussion, activities. Um, you can find it there at the tiny URL LR study guide. Um, additionally, we'll be sending out links to everyone who registered uh, for this call. Um, we also have some Love Resist worship materials um, that can be included in a service. Uh, while it's designed as one full service, uh, any piece of it can be pulled out and included in a particular service to bring the spirit of this uh, into your worship. And uh, we also have a team building guide. Um, I uh, noticed that the slide that was just pulled up, um, the date and time isn't given, but I can give that to you right now. Uh, we recognize that facilitating conversations about criminalization, about issues of oppression and racism can be challenging. And so we wanted to open up a space where the people who participated today and people who want to facilitate uh, the Love Resist Guide for a Deeper Resistance could come together and um, Think a bit about um, facilitation tips. Um, think a bit about uh, what questions have risen for them, what has been challenging for them, and um, speak about that as they prepare to bring it to um, a group locally. Um, additionally, um, I wanted to make sure that everybody got the information with, oh, oh and so I'm sorry, so the date and time for that is going to be on two weeks from now on the 28th. Um, and it's going to be at 1 p.m. Eastern. Again, all of this plus a link will be included in the follow-up email. Um, yeah. uh, we also wanted to make sure that you have an opportunity to learn more about and follow the organizations that were featured here tonight, um, since I am sure you found some inspiration. And so here are the links to their websites, and I'm pretty sure they all have Facebook and uh, Twitter. Um, to follow as well. And uh, perhaps um, we can close out with each of our speakers sharing just a word or phrase um, that brings them inspiration uh, today. And uh, actually, I'm going to share mine because it speaks so much to, I think, the last thing that um, Jamila uh, raised, which is uh, James Baldwin, when he said, um, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. And uh, we're certainly at a time where we're facing the reality of this country in a new way. Um, and maybe that is where change can come from. All right, so what's give you, giving you inspiration? One word or phrase, Ruth? Um, one of my favorites is uh, from um, the ancestor Ida B. Wells, um, who says that uh, 
the way to change things, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing, is to shine the light of, to, the way to right wrong is to shine the light of truth on them. Um, one of the things that I've learned very much is that, you know, honesty is so needed in this movement. Um, if we are not truthful about the things that are happening to us in our own personal lives, um, and also what we see happening in our communities, and we are doing a disservice, I've been in too many rooms where people um, choose not to say anything because they're waiting for permission to tell the truth, right? And so the more of us have courage to be able to do so, then I think that, you know, yeah, it, it gets better that way. Thank you. Fatima? Um, so for me, it's imagination. I think um, um, for me, what what's really inspiring is, you know, for us to really be radically like creative and use our imagination to, to think about what we actually want the world to look like and not not just, you know, fighting the day-to-day -day things that are happening, but um, to really use our imagination to, to think about those new new structures. Um, so to me, as we're gearing up for, for year two of the Trump administration and, and knowing what's what's coming, I always think of, of Maya Angelou's quote of, we may encounter many defeats, but we may not be defeated. So how we're able to continue to, to be fighting in the struggle. Um, for me, this, this actually comes from some faith-based sisters that I first started working with many years ago, uh, the Sisters of Mercy. Um, if anyone's familiar with them, they lay down in, in front of deportation buses and they're like 80 years old and they're total rock star nuns. They just don't give a shit. I'm sorry. I don't know if I'm allowed to say that. <laughs> they just don't care. Um, and, and what comes from that for me is uh, by any means necessary by Malcolm X. I, I really, that resonates with me whenever I think about the reality of, of this movement Moving into year two, as Santa said, it's important for us to be ready and to gear up and to realize that it's going to be a whole different, whole different movement than what we ever thought it was going to be before. Thank you all. All right. Thanks, everybody, for joining us today. And uh, this is just a start of a conversation that will be continuing. So. Um, yeah, please be in touch. We will send out information uh, with all of those links, both to the organizations of the presenters and to the study guide. Uh, and um, yeah, please uh, let us know about the work that you're doing too. This is a movement that we are building together. All right, have a great night. Thank you again to our speakers. Let's see if I can unmute. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, now I'm unmuting all, and we can all say thank you. Good night, everybody.